Airing on Asheville FM 103.3 LPFM in Asheville, this is the Final Straw Radio. This week we recorded a chat with Pip, a defendant in, and Grace, a supporter of the Aston Park defendant's case, which led to the arrest of 16 people, including two journalists for the Asheville Blade, many facing charges of felony littering and conspiracy to felony litter. My name is Pip, and I currently have a felony littering charge associated with all this hubbub. Been around the Asheville area about 15 years and affiliations. I'm just a country queer. Um, my name's Grace. I use their she pronouns. Um, and I've been in Asheville for about 17 years. I've done some work alongside Asheville Survival Program and then um, became involved in this absurd case. Um, cool. So we're here to speak about the Aston Park defendants' cases and the circumstances surrounding them as they, again, wind their way through the courts. I'd like to go a bit more into detail about the cases, but in the meantime, if you could just give us a quick overview of the incidents and the charges that people are currently facing, that'd be super helpful. Yeah. So um, 16 folks received felony littering charges, and this was in regards to a demonstration in a, in a public park in Asheville advocating for sanctuary camping for folks that live on the streets. And that happened um, around Christmas time in 2021. And so we've just been in the long slag of court ever since then with those charges. And the charges are pretty rare felony littering, which is not a common charge. <laughs> is that sort of a a thing that people react to when you tell them that or when you've um, interacted with the court system? Uh, like, this is what I'm f- charged that I'm facing or whatever? Yes, I've definitely had people when I've been explaining what's going on, um, find it pretty unbelievable, like to the point of like wondering if I'm making it up, I suppose. But even um, judges at different day- court days that we've had have like thrown their hands up in exasperation or been like visibly frustrated about how stupid this whole thing is. So I feel like there's got to be some hope of this getting dropped if even the judges think it's stupid, but who knows? Let's see. So I think it would be fair to say that the foundation of what is being struggled over in the courts right now is the question of how houseless neighbors are treated, what resources are made available to them, and how that's done. Can you talk a bit about Asheville generally, something about the city politics and the industries here, how the city is presented generally like as a progressive city and who lives on the streets and in, in, in the wild spaces around here? So Asheville definitely bills itself as kind of the a progressive haven or a little blue dot I often hear it referred to as. And our primary uh, economic driver is tourism. And we also have just an exorbitant amount of breweries. We've seen an influx of people also over uh, the past several years from all over the country, um, especially through through COVID. So we have a lot of new folks in the area. We spend a lot of money through the Tourism and Development Authority trying to attract people to come here. And our unhoused neighbors are, you know, being pushed further and further out as housing prices increase. We have the highest cost of living in uh, the state. And so people will be camping often on roadsides, um, which is, Usually NCDOT property or, you know, there are some other spots where people just are trying to find some place to go because it's basically illegal to sleep anywhere um, in our town. And we're spending a lot of money on uh, sweeping any encampments that that they find, that the police find. And as far as who's homeless in Nashville, that that demographic information is a little different depending on who you're talking to. Some homeless service providers that take care of the Local chronically homeless list, say up to 90% of folks are local. The annual census data says about 71% of folks are local. But as far as demographics within that, it definitely hits the black community a lot harder. Like the black homeless population is twice as large as Asheville's black population at large. And then what we just have seen is just such a rapid rise in the rent prices. So it's just pushing out locals. I think anecdotally in the 15 years that I've been here, rent has about tripled, but more concrete data that we've gotten recently said that rents raised 41% since just the beginning of the pandemic. So I know this isn't Asheville specific. A lot of places are dealing with this, but it's just super rapid rise in rent prices. 
Yeah, and I guess there's there's an element of that too around like housing stock and availability that probably contributes to the increased cost. Not only like whether it be that a lot of people are moving here and there's not keeping a pace of that with construction of new quote unquote affordable housing, but also like houses that or rooms that would be considered long term rentals going into things like Verbo and Airbnb for short term turnover at a higher price. Is that is that like another thing that's contributing to this issue? I think definitely. Um, the city of Asheville in name has a ban on Airbnbs. However, they don't enforce it at all. So I believe there's like 5,000 Airbnbs in Buncombe County. And and so that has pushed a lot of people out all the time. I find that I have people reaching out to me who have had their rents either gone up significantly overnight or their ha- their landlords are selling their houses out from under them or converting them to an Airbnb. Mm-hmm. I know that Asheville Free Press has, has recently done some analyzing of local GIS data saying that 11% of all housing stock here is owned by people with primary addresses out of state. And so that doesn't even take into account people who have multiple um, addresses here in town that could be airbnb And I think another big thing that we've seen is just n- there's been no new p- public housing stock in such a long time here. So our current wait list for single units is two to three years and that's if you can jump through all the hoops on the way to get one of those units. So yeah, just not enough housing stock for for folks that live here. I know I've lived in a couple of apartment complexes that used to be public housing that then transitioned into like mixed section 8 housing for listeners that aren't familiar like so buildings that were built with public money to be able to provide affordable or free housing for folks on disability, folks who were just without the income to be able to provide housing for themselves. Otherwise, suddenly, like over the number of years, like getting privatized, say like the woods, for instance, I lived in and I moved there, I think, seven years into the 10 year plan that they had where they were purchased by a private management company. They were capped on how much they could raise rent each year during that period of time. But after that 10 year period, um, that housing was going to be just available to whoever. Being near the university, I'm sure that it went you know, to a bunch of students that were coming in from out of town that maybe had the resources available and pushed out the mostly working class and largely black and brown population of folks that were living there and who had been living there for a number of years. And I imagine that like that's another contributing factor to this sort of thing when we're talking about public housing. Yeah, I know that Hawthorne is one of the property groups that just said they would no longer accept Section 8 vouchers. Um, There's been some push in the community to try to get some kind of income discrimination ordinance because the landlords are still getting paid and actually really reliably from the government funding sources. So especially given the population that receives those vouchers too, I mean, I think that there's a case to be made that it's housing discrimination period to not accept those. But that's another huge issue. And families wait sometimes years on the wait list to receive the vouchers only to not actually be able to use them once they receive them because there's no place that will accept them. Yeah, if you go on the Asheville Craigslist and housing and just type in Section 8, um, the last number of times I've done that, the only time Section 8 comes up is on housing that's listed that says no Section 8. So it's pretty wild to see how few places will take them. Listeners to the show may be familiar with some of the incidents and groups that are involved in this discussion around the Aston Park repression. Basically, like over the years, we've talked uh, to people like um, Ursula Wren about the how the policing crisis, quote unquote, in August of 2020 and spoken with people from Asheville Survival Program. We've spoken with folks about the defendant's case and about the protests around housing when they were um, and sweeps when they were going on. But um, for those who aren't, can you all give kind of a like quick background to ASP and the local police's attitudes to them? Yeah, so Asheville Survival Program started at the beginning of the pandemic. And when it first started, it was primarily grocery delivery for folks that were immunocompromised and couldn't leave their house. And then um, the health department um, shut down the ability for the local homeless day center to serve coffee and food. And so a bunch of sweeties decided to take that on. And they were doing it seven days a week, which is like pretty much a miracle to have punks be awake early in the morning, seven days a week for a really long time. But as services have come back, that has gotten pared down to Saturday and Sundays throughout those three years. Asheville Survival Program also operated a free store for quite a while and uh, along with funding direct aid asks. And 
as far as the um, tension, I would say the tensions began rising when the police made associations between Asheville Survival Program and some demonstrations at big camp evictions. And so that's where the tension started. And it grew a lot because um, Asheville Survival Program, ASP from here on out, just served food in a public park that's really close to a very fancy set of tennis courts that are some fancy clay floor that people come from far away to play tennis on. And so I think the citywide tension started rising very quickly because a lot of those tennis players have a fair bit of pull with the city. So the um, the fight of like whose who's space is this public park kept getting amplified and amplified because of that tension between the tennis court people not wanting to see poor people on the weekends when they're trying to play tennis and when ASP was had food and gear and stuff at the park. So years ago, we were talking to Steady Collective and when they were using space rented by Firestorm Books, they continued to, to have their van out front and provide services on Tuesdays. But uh, there had been a big backlash from ostensibly from business owners, maybe from just like concerned NIMBY, NIMBY neighbors. I'm kind of not clear on on who all makes up this diffuse cloud of, of fart smell that have been messing with projects like steady distributing needles. But I feel like there's an, there's an overlap between the groups or interests or whatever business associations get formed that um, have been messing with steady and trying to press the city and the state to outlaw certain forms of, of distribution and some of the pressure that ASP and adjacent activists have been facing. Is that fair to say? And are there any like groups that stand out to you? I mean, I know that there is a group called Asheville Business Owners, which is incredibly vague. We don't know exactly who all um, is a part of that group. They had put up a large billboard um, on Patton Avenue saying, we love the cops um, or something like that. And there's certainly a group now that regularly attends city council meetings. Um, I think they're calling themselves the Asheville Coalition for Public Safety. I call them the Citizens Council. And they... Um, are connected, obviously, um, in this class of people. And they're they're pretty well organized. I'll give them that. And they've really used a lot of high pressure tactics and fear mongering in order to go after these kinds of things where community care, where we're helping our neighbors. And then also they're in January of 2022. So right after this incident happened, there was a police officer, Mike Lamb, who said openly at a city council meeting that they don't arrest homeless folks, they arrest, quote, activists and anarchists. So there's certainly an element about, you know, who who is allowed to have a say and what what forms of political speech are permitted. And I would also add to that a big part of a lot of these like pretty organized anti-homeless groups has been to propagate this myth, which once again, I know this is not an Asheville specific thing, but that homeless people here are coming from other places that they're getting bust in or they're it's a if you build it, they will come thing that the reason there's homeless people here is because there's homeless services here. And <clears throat> that's just like it's patently untrue, but they've been really successful in putting that myth out there and in inflating the public safety data. Specifically, there was a recent article that came out showing that the crime downtown has gone down, but there's still all these really nasty articles coming back out about how unsafe it is and how unsanitary it is because all these people are coming from elsewhere. And it just seems like a really easy task tactic to crack down on stuff when you're when you're othering people. It's like, this is not this is not our people. These are people coming from elsewhere and pooping somewhere because there's no public bathroom or whatever. Yeah, I think I, there was um, also at that previous city council meeting in January 22, there was just a, a presentation that was made with these horrific graphics where it had like a tent in the middle of two concentric circles where whoever the data analyst is for Asheville police um, was trying to claim that the vast majority of so-called crime in downtown Asheville was from um, our unhoused population. And the way that they did that is that they took a spreadsheet um, where 
for example, one that I specifically remember is that somebody had called in the Montford neighborhood and said someone's sleeping in a car. They took that location point. They drew a 500 foot radius around it. Then they drew a thousand foot radius around it. And they took all the crime data from an entire year. And you, and that was their methodology, which, you know, just from my basic memory of high school statistics class, I knew that that was nonsense and um, had a data analyst look it over and disprove it all. But it didn't matter because it, the narrative was already out there. It already made its way through the media. There's no accountability, um, you know, in terms of getting them to correct that data. And I think we know likely on March 28th at the next um public safety meeting, they're going to do another data dump where they try to attribute crime to homeless people. And I'm assuming we're going to have no background information on where where they even got their numbers. Um, so that's something that's really important to me personally to keep an eye on uh, because they're definitely using it to fuel, fuel their narrative. And um, I don't think that they have people who know how to math um, at Asheville Police Department. And they're and they they come up with you know they start with what they want to present and then they make up the data to to quote unquote support it. <laughs> can I put in a little just like can I address something real quick that's out of context of this question? I just know that sometimes when I speak on rad outlets um sometimes people have issues with the use of the word homeless and so i just wanted to put in a little thing there of like while i totally understand that some people identify as houseless or different sets of words there i've been corrected a lot more times into saying homeless and so sometimes i just worry that rad communities make up pc terms that might not be coming from the populations that they're talking about. So that's why I personally use that word. But I know that in the past, I've gotten um, some shit from like rad outlets for using that word. So just saying why. <laughs> Back in 2012, we did a conversation uh, with folks that were resisting a business improvement district that was being planned for downtown. And that was um, when Firestorm was still down there and as a local business was like helping to push against that alongside a bunch of other folks like whether it be like folks from the homeless community the houses community what have you or like other concerned community members and i've heard inklings that there's a push for a similar thing now i don't know if that's i don't really have the details and if that's like a downtown thing or west Asheville thing or, or what but is that is that worth bringing up in this context or should i move on to the next question I don't know. It's not something, I feel like it's not something that everyone away, like they bring it up from time to time. It's something a lot of council memory members through time have like thought was lovely. And um, I feel like there is a lot of grisly momentum right now of like specifically downtown anti-homeless sentiments. And it's the words, those words have come up again, but I wouldn't say it's unique right now because they just bring it up a couple times a year. Grace, have you experienced that? So right now I'm seeing specifically Sage Turner pushing for this, but I think one, some of the pushback that they're receiving on is that that, my understanding is that it would mean actually higher taxes for downtown businesses. So of course they want to protect their capital, which is what all of this, you know, is always about. Um, so I, you know, I think it's, I'll be curious to see how that plays out from the folks who have been pushing for more policing, if that's something that they actually want, if it means that they would have to actually take money out of their own pockets. Well, now that we've gotten some of the context out of the way for the case, I wonder if you all could talk a bit about how the cases are going, how many folks are still facing charges, if, if some folks have settled, and yeah, kind of what's what's going to trial? Yeah, for sure. So... It's been a long span of a lot of uneventful things for most of it. There there have been three individuals that have taken plea deals, and mostly that was for folks that were uh, looking at more severe consequences. And so the rest of the folks are either going to trial on April 10th, if the state decides to go through with it, or they're just off the calendar. So charges are not dropped. They're just in the matrix, I guess. But um, so four or five folks are going to be taken to trial on April 10th, as it stands now. And they're just holding the other cases open, correct? So that's something to kind of hold over over people's heads. It's not like going to be a resolution for them either. Yeah. I 
it, it feels like this is just my speculation that what they're doing is if they can win this trial, then they'll probably keep pursuing it. And if they can't, then it will probably be resolved. Or if they win this trial, then they may feel they have the leverage to force the other people into accepting whatever pleas, if that's even a possibility anymore, I guess. Um, because the state has been offering pleas and people have just said mostly that like, this is unreasonable. <laughs> I'm not going to do this. I'd rather fight this, which I really respect. Cause that's like on top of, on top of having something ar- like floating around for a little over a year, but you know, the, you know, it'll be almost a year and a half since the arrests. Yeah. If I could say something real quick though, sure. I think a lot of those, um, the plea deals have seemed completely unappetizing to most people because, um, for a lot of folks, I, they're just like, was not illegal things that were done. So I think for a lot of folks, it's like, I just don't want to face any consequences because I literally have a felony charge for bringing seven pizzas to a park, which is just not illegal. So, um, the state could offer like, oh, you could take this misdemeanor with all this community service. But I think a lot of folks don't want to do that for bringing hot cocoa to the park, you know? <laughs> so, Yeah, I was at one of the one of the pleas and to hear them read aloud <laughs> the allegations of what was brought to the park, which was like clothing to be distributed, some sheets and you know, I think toilet paper, like the the items to hear them say it out loud in court. Um, it just, you know, I just kept waiting for the judge to go, wait, stop. What do you mean? Um, but that, of course that didn't happen. Yeah. Listening to the state throughout this process has been really funny. Like the assistant DA will say things like these people were advocating for there to be places for homeless people to camp and they'll say it like it's this ridiculous crazy thing but I think at the core of this it just brings to light like what what we call trash here so Mm -hmm. um I just think of an example of just like if I left my wallet somewhere and someone threw it away it doesn't mean that my wallet is trash it just means that someone threw it away so like just looking at this whole situation it just seems like the state is framing things as trash, which just clearly is people's like survival items. As far as media coverage has gone, it, it seems like until the last couple of months, it's been pretty scant. Once the ACLU, the American Civil Liberties Union, which is like a legal organization, the chapter for North Carolina, began making statements concerning park bans for defendants and requesting release of body cam footage from the arrests and making statements about the arrest of, of journalists while doing their jobs. Uh, and also, defendant Sarah Norris was has been willing to speak about their experiences to numerous outlets uh, at the local and national level, which I think is awesome. How do you feel the media coverage has been? What's shifted? And uh, what have you seen the impact uh, towards the prosecution of the case? Yeah, I don't know. I've been, I've been really surprised at how well some of the local outlets have presented this case, because in general, like our local TV station just usually just will present whatever uh, APD posts on their Facebook. It's very high quality journalism. But throughout this process, just media outlets that usually would not be helpful in a case like this have been pretty helpful. So it was pretty wild, like when the ACLU asked for the body cam footage to be released to them, the city just decided to put it all on the internet as kind of a like, well, fuck you, who are going to put this all on the internet? And it just totally all of the media coverage from it was like, wow, look how ridiculous the police are being in this footage. So it was really lovely to have something that was meant to harm us, like just be taken and looked at. And the the resolution was like, this is ridiculous. So that felt really good, especially when it was done by conservative media outlets that we wouldn't normally trust to have good coverage of such a thing. Yeah, I've been really impressed with Asheville Citizen Times as well and have been really appreciative of their coverage of this. They've definitely stayed on top of it throughout the process and even show up at court dates and stuff like that. So, you know, I think local journalism is really important to be able to have somebody who has eyes on this. And, you know, I think the ACLU involvement helped significantly. It's important. I don't think we explained actually how the ACLU is involved, but that the people who were arrested on felony littering charges were banned from all city parks for three years. And so there's really no place that you could 
at that at that point, you, there's no place they could really even protest at all, legally, publicly. Um, and they did that. I mean, obviously, these these cases are still open, so they did that with with no no information on why, you know, why they were doing it, what even the allegations were. And then there were also the, on Christmas night, there were two journalists who were arrested the body cam footage really clearly shows that police say, hey, look, they're filming, let's arrest them first. And they call them journalists. They know they're journalists. Um, And one of the tactics they're using in that is to just try to say, well, they're not they're not journalists, but the police called them journalists. So, I guess the one clear exam- like exception to the local coverage has been the really sharp turnaround of Asheville Watchdog. Now that they've maybe that's why the Citizen Times has gotten better is because they got rid of John Boyle. Ugh. Yeah, I knew I my flags were raised when Asheville Watchdog hired John Boyle because I actually went. We, I mean. We reached out to Watchdog from the beginning because there are, you know, started by some retired Pulitzer Prize winning journalists who moved to Asheville. And I was like, cool, we really need some investigative journalism on this. And now they have just taken this this hard turn and are posting these really gross articles just trying to villainize this population. And they're really loving Mike Lamb, who has been (laughs) um, the, you know, the officer who has been hell-bent on pursuing these. And I, I mean, I even see this guy going downtown harassing people. I'm like, how much time do you have on your hands to just, like, he's pretty high up in the department to, like, personally harass people who are sleeping on the streets. Um, So that's, That's definitely been very disappointing. And um, I think that kind of speaks to the neoliberal agenda. (laughs) If you're looking for updates about the struggle in Atlanta to stop Cop City and defend the Atlanta forest slash Wilani, you can find a recent episode of the IGD This Is America podcast which features an interview with folks from the Atlanta Community Press Collective. IGD is a member of the Channel Zero Network of Anarchist Podcasts. You can find this episode alongside a bunch of other recent episodes dating back years at channelzeronetwork.com. And here's a jingle from another member of CZN. to Dissident Island Radio. Check out www.dissidentisland.org for downloads and more. So for me, a really important element of how this case moves forward has been the collective voice of the defendants working to keep focus, not just on the injustice of their cases, but continuing to center the context of narratives around homelessness, poverty, access, policy, and community. Because as these cases continue, the city, police, and national media are still pushing that that narrative that was just mentioned about a, like a woke Asheville that's a cesspool of sin where violent drug addled crime is endemic and the embattled police don't have the resources that they need. I wonder if you could both talk a little bit about this narrative, who you see pushing it and and what you see as the goals. And is it is it getting a bite or is it just the most like rabid conservatives that are that are actually believing it? Well, I don't know. It's 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 weird because sometimes it feels like both. Like there's been moments over the past couple of years where I know that some of the complaints that I I personally don't believe data backs up has made it to national news. Our police being understaffed made it to the cover of the New York Times recently. That nasty watchdog article made it to Fox News nationally. This idea that Asheville's super violent. I don't personally, I've never felt unsafe here. And um, the data doesn't seem to back up these wild things. So like, there'll be moments where these strange local complaints will get far flung attention but i don't i don't know who's who's running that so like who's making that happen when it does happen so it's hard to say because like at times it feels like 
it's a lot of people and times it feels like it's no one. I have a suspect, um, <laughs> which could potentially be Cole Pro Media, which is the PR firm that Asheville police hired for I think $225,000 of taxpayer expense. They originally um, brought them in after we made national news during the uprisings in in 2020 when police violently destroyed a medic station and they were like stabbing water bottles. It was really something to see. So they hired this cleanup firm that you know, works, works, actually, um, it's an ex TV journalist, Laura Cole, who owns the company. And I haven't been able to show the link to that and this, you know, citizens group. But I know that one of the, for example, one of the people who's involved in Asheville Citizens for Public Safety is the wife of the chief of police. So, you know, they're obviously getting information fed to them directly from police. You know, I don't think any of them are getting paid. They, I can't believe they haven't asked for their piece of the pie because there are people, you know, they have a whole firm that's devoted to this. And they have another firm that's devoted to also trying to recruit, epic recruiting that's trying to recruit police officers in Asheville. By the police's own admission, it will take them 10 years to return to normal staffing levels, which I say, yay. Um, <laughs> so it's funny because they're like, more money, more money. But like, there's no one to hire. Nobody wants to be police. That's great news. I'm happy to hear it. And so, you know, I'm not sure what their intention is to do with the end of this process, because at the end of the day, you don't have the staff, you don't have the staff, and they've refused to move any of the police budget, or we don't even actually know the numbers, like how much extra money do the police have because of the staffing shortage that we could be funneling into any kind of other community services that could help like such as overdose response or helping homeless people and and we just keep putting more and more money towards that they also just voted to to spend five hundred thousand dollars from our covid19 american rescue plan act funds to uh clear encampments so i think that it's a small group of vocal people who are directly tied to the police it's such a wild dichotomy, though, also to see them so loudly complaining about being understaffed while completely refusing to cede any like responsibility to other kinds of responses and, and, and like strange animosities being brought up when anybody offers to like to do some of that work. Like I, I know there was a couple years ago. I worked at a drop-in center, homeless drop-in center, and had been there. And over the, the two years that I was there, um, I think there was only like two a year, like staff initiated calls to 911. I mean, for um, non-ambulance issues. And that made the a APD really mad at us that we weren't calling them. And they had to like, we had to go in for this meeting because they were all angry. And I remember the police chief saying like, you can't just not call us when you don't need us. <laughs> and it was like, wait, is this, like train the public to use 911? Like don't call it when you don't need them. And so like the idea that like people were using de-escalation and not the police made them very mad. And like from on my part was the beginning of this um, animosity between, like it, it became a little personal, like between me and APD was this like idea that we would like dare to use de-escalation instead of 911. It made them very upset. Uh, as Grace pointed to, it takes a while for the cops to train themselves and get experience and, and get out into the field. But like there's an element of attrition, right, where people are actually quitting the force. Like, for instance, there was there was a, I don't know if it was that same New York Times story, but there was the New York Times story about the one officer who had quit the APD when she had been hired. She was like touted by the department as a diversity hire because she was a lesbian and then she quit and then like later went on to the to the New York Times again, got interviewed about how she got rehired, because even though she had taken this ethical stance before they offered her more money. So she decided to come back. But there's like something not to say that there's a good way to run a police force, but it seems like they're doing something wrong if they're like losing hires to other cities or or is it just the woke Asheville culture is poisoning new recruits and turning them 
into Antifa super soldiers that are fighting the police. <laughs> well, that's the funny thing about that article, because that officer said that the reason they quit was because people kept chanting at them, all gay cops are traitors. <laughs> funny it's true but, yeah it's just like all those woke gays <laughs> i don't know it, it is there does seem to be this sentiment that you'll hear from these people like if we could just love the police enough like if we would just tell them how much we love them enough then they would come back like you know they're like no you city council members won't say you love the police like that was a big attack on them that we saw coming out but i personally if any if any former apd officers are listening to this i would love to really i mean i imagine there have to be people who say like, no, I'm not going to gas my community. Um, <laughs> yeah, I just don't, you know, we live in a small town, relatively speaking, like you start, you know, we're in community with each other, you run into people. And I, I mean, I just think that even on the body cam footage, there is an officer who says, you know, why are we here? Why are we doing this? And I, and I'm like, if you, I, you know, I'm like, if this officer, I don't know who, what, who that is, but you know, you don't have to do this job. You know, there are plenty of ways where if you really got into policing, cause you care about your community, you want to support them. There are ways you can actually do that. Yeah. <laughs> On the body cam footage, there is another really beautiful moment where the police and other people were just like far apart and were yelling and one person yelled like you're getting paid shit to do terrible shit and you could just hear the chatter between them like well she's got a point and like there was there was like, <laughs> like it's like Christmas. Right. <laughs> you could like go work at target and make as much money like why would you choose this it doesn't make sense <laughs> Another thing that came out on the footage, if I'm if I'm correct, and there there are some like shortened. You don't have to like people have done the terrible work of watching hours and hours and hours of like twelve hours or however much it was of of the police bantering and sort of like doofily walking into stuff. And um, they don't they get a call about like some sort of robbery going on across town and then decide to maybe I'm misremembering this and then deciding to like, rather than go on the call, they call like more units down to the park to deal with the circumstances on the ground. So I didn't see that part of the footage. I admittedly like chopped footage together. It's, it got very confusing because it's all the different angles at once, but I do believe that that was in, in a part of it. And we also learned in court that they had every single officer from Asheville police at the park that night with the exception of two. So, you know, when there's all these claims that they're so, you know, oh, we need, is this how we're going to direct our resources? It, it, it's even by their own logic, it doesn't make sense. Yeah. And I would, I don't know if this is coming up later in questions, but I also would say in looking back at their investigation of these littering charges, there was a phenomenal amount of resources used in some of it, like, they had put a tracker on ASP's van. They had put a camera across the street from the free store. They had been watching like ASP's food distro just from the tennis court building. And so just like looking at all these like hundreds and hundreds of hours of <clears throat> work about like picnics to surveil picnics was really wild to like see that and then hear them be like, we're so short staffed. Do you all happen to have the numbers of how much they claimed it cost to cart away the garbage that led to the felony charges and how much do we have any assumptions about how much they've spent on this case so far? So, I mean, their claim is that it took them uh, like $1,600 or something, 2000 I don't I think remember. 2600 I think. Yeah, to, to tote it away. And it was funny, even on like AP, APD's Facebook put that number out. And even like, I don't think you could find a more biased crowd than the people who follow APD on Facebook. But even within those comments, they're like, whoa, like that doesn't really look like trash. And wait, you had to use machinery? You really underpay your workers. And it was just really funny, like from how many different angles they got attacked about it. But um, I, I stopped doing math because it was getting just so absurd of how much money they put into it. But I will say, I did do the math about how much money it took them to do <clears throat> the park van appeals. 
when they banned everyone from parks and then had these appeal meetings and they had a lot of very well-paid people at those meetings. So in doing the math about how much money they put into just that part of the process, which is very small compared to like all the court costs and all of this, it would have paid for dumpsters and toilet services at two camps for a full year. So looking at like data comparisons like that, it's just like this is a choice and they could choose to do something different with those resources that like actually would address trash. But um, if they're so worried about trash, there is like ways <laughs> to facilitate trash cleanup, which is providing services to camps. Yeah, it's like a trash can. What a novel concept. It's like, you know, I, I it, it's it's ridiculous to just hear hear it over and over again when you're like, OK, well, then a, bath, a bathroom and trash service would get us a really long way into addressing what their supposed concerns are. It just makes it very clear that this entire thing is not about trash. When, yeah, and that you're, and that they're, they're talking about humans as trash. That I mean, that's what, um, you know, that's one of the most disturbing parts about it. I guess, like, back on the subject of like the amount of resources that the city and the police and the prosecutors are putting into the case. District Attorney Todd Williams has been getting a lot of heat for a backlog of murder cases that they haven't a- attempted to prosecute. And I think that I have seen people address this issue in some pretty thoughtful manners. And I would love to hear like, like, A, if you could talk a little bit about what that is, the, the 40 cases or so, and also like the dangers of talking about it wrong, what, what people could miss pretty easily, because it, I could see some news source just being like, oh, oh we, you know, like we've got a lot of murders going on. We need more police, uh, you know, sort of thing. But yeah, I mean, I think that looking at that, the reason that stands out is gross to me is that the state is prioritizing this so heavily, this advocating for sanctuary camping and like punishing that they're advocating that so harsh for that so harshly that they're willing to keep people who are waiting for their, their like day in court about some of those long-term charges. Like they've been in County jail, not prison for years. And they're just having them sit there and sit there while they uh, hash out what is trash and what is not trash and like like kids in the park so it just is like a just a complete disregard for those people that are just sitting and waiting in buncom county detention center which is the deadliest jail in the state of north carolina eight people died in like less than a two-year period um in that jail and so when i think about it that's what i think about i think about the risk to you know holding up the legal system when they're literally people's lives on the line who are in there right now. Especially a lot of the people were in Buncombe County through COVID, which Buncombe County jails already suck so badly. And how bad it sucked during COVID was just awful. Like not being able to leave your cell at all and two meals a day. And just like, so like these people that have been here for years waiting and they're like, we got to talk about this. We got to talk about this park and the pizzas that are there. Like it's very important. It's been really interesting to watch this district attorney um, as well. He he sort of ran as a reformer and he almost lost his reelection campaign by like 100 votes. And the Asheville police, there was a leak memo that went out that was that Asheville police put out to attack Todd Williams and try to claim that basically he wasn't being tough enough on, you know, so-called nuisance crimes stuff like like urinating in public and stuff of that nature. But now he's really pushing back and trying to blame the judges and the magistrates. So that's definitely, to me, that's interesting to watch because it's my belief that the people who are out to get Todd, that there's like, uh, he's not going to be able to make them happy no matter what he does. And yet he is working overtime to try to please them. He's like an evil marshmallow. I hate that. I hear he just like wanders around the park. You can find him just wandering around the parking deck by the courthouse, just in circles really weirdly. He's looking for Dookie or whatever? Or... <laughs> yeah. <laughs> um, he's, he's also really hard to get in touch with. Um, he, his office didn't even have a voicemail box set up for a while. So, yeah, he's, he's incredibly inaccessible. Yeah, he kind of ran in his first campaign on, among other things, like not prosecuting people for weed. And this is <laughs> this, this is what he's doing, like, into his second term. Good job, dude. He's also had some attrition that he's had to deal with, as I understand. A bunch of, like, ADAs have left 
Yeah, I mean, I think there's definitely a staffing uh, crisis, which makes it all the more ridiculous that they also have limited resources um, and are, are using their time with this. But, you know, I actually tried reaching out to their office yesterday and they directed me to the ADA who is on this case. But we know that Todd is also directly and heavily involved. And I'm sure that's at great pressure from Asheville police. Because I mentioned Sarah Norris before, um, who's one of the defendants, like their willingness to talk to the media about their personal experiences and the impacts of this case have been, I think, really moving for a lot of people. Being a parent who can't take their kids to the park, you know, and and for for as has been pointed out for the ridiculous charges that they're facing for like supposedly going out right before a blizzard to like try to stop the the city from evicting yet another park that people like that the city had at one point said that people could camp there because they had been moved off of like cherry street or something like that so yeah anyway the fact that sarah has been willing to go out there and speak about that i think is again really powerful i wonder if you could talk a little bit about the disruption that the case has caused in people's lives the wasted energy and the resources that could have been directed towards helping people survive or or get off the streets if that's what they want and what you'd like to see come out of these trials yeah, I don't know. I feel like it's been different for different people. Like some people have lost their housing or um, jobs, different thing, like tangible things. I think a big loss was that ASP had to move out of the public parks because we weren't able to have enough people show up every week because so many folks were banned from public parks that do the food distro every week. And I think it's just like a loss to lose like the only public forum in town as a place to gather and have meetings, especially during COVID when it's nice to have outdoor meetings. What was the second part of that question? <laughs> it was, it was impact. It was kind of long. Kind of what you'd like to see come out of the trials, like obviously besides charges dropped. I, yeah. So I, I would love, I do think, I do hope that the ACLU addressing the park ban policy will help, help make a meaningful long-term change on how, people being banned from public spaces is in the future. I also think if, if that goes well, like if the criminal charges get dropped, that civil case goes well, that there might be a lot more hesitancy to arrest people in public spaces, kick them out of public spaces. So it would be good just to address how people use the public space, who is the public space for. This is a big dream. I don't, I'm not sure that this is on the, on the table, but I would love if the city of Asheville had to pay for what they've done in dollars and that that money could go back into mutual aid. That would be my biggest, biggest, most beautiful dream. And, you know, I like to envision also just like a huge park party when, when everyone can go back and we have this beautiful moment together because, you know, that week was really one of the most beautiful things I've ever seen or been a part of in my life um, to, to see the community that was being built at the park. And um, I actually, I brought, I brought my mom with me on, on Christmas morning and she still talks about that as she's like, this is the best Christmas we've ever had. This is, you know, this is exactly what we, we want to be doing and, and being a part of caring for each other. Cause I think that that's just part of who we are. And I, and I see my neighbors doing that all the time, you know, as much as they're these vocal people, one thing that I actually really love about Asheville is that there is this sense of community and taking care of one another. Um, and we will not let them take that away from us, no matter what happens with these charges. I guess the final question that I have is uh, like legal fees aren't cheap. Uh, do you all have fundraising around the case that you would care to boost? And what about spreading the word about the case? Can you point listeners to where they can find more or offer other ways of support? Yes. Um, so we we do have some funds and are collecting money for the upcoming trial date just for folks who have to take those weeks off of work. And our Venmo is ABL Defendant Fund. And then our website to follow stuff is avlsolidarity.noblogs.org. Thank you, Grace. <laughs> oh, you're good. Teamwork. Um, there's also a two-part episode on It Could Happen Here, one interview with Sarah Norris and another with the, somebody from the ACLU who really goes into detail about that. Um, that I would point people to listen to. 
and you know just in general there's there you can reach out on the on the at avlsolidarity.noblogs.org to if you have other connections for other news orgs that might want to provide coverage for this because I think that this is a pattern of the criminalization of protests. We're seeing that a lot uh, with what's happening in Atlanta right now. Um, and that's been really heavy on my mind um, as I've been watching um, the Cop City Project and the domestic terrorism charges that people who are also just sitting in a park have received. And there's also a sub stack now, right? We can- oh, let me find that. <laughs> oh, this is While you're finding it, I'll just say, but if you, if you do have resources, another spot to throw them would be Asheville Survival Program to keep them in coffee and things like that. And they are at AVL Survival. And that's the handle on Instagram also that um, the defendants usually put out statements. So the, if you want to follow it on Substack, it's Sanctuary Camp Defendant Updates.substack.com. We'll link it. It's easier that way. Cool. Yeah. Cool. <laughs> Thank you. Is there anything that I didn't ask about that you that like you're inspired to address right now? Mm. Take your time and think about it if you want to. I can't think of much. I, I just have been really inspired to watch all the folks who've been going through this and how um, they've pursued it um, because it's so important for them to be able to stand up to this um, and for us to be able to talk about what's going on um, in our community. And um, I think that even though we can talk about how the number of resources that they're spending on this are, you know, that that's ridiculous. I think it just shows how powerful mutual aid really is or else they wouldn't be spending these kind of resources to, to tear it down. So, um, you know, if people are listening to this in other places, connecting in with where your mutual aid programs are happening, that would be really great too. So we can grow that. Do you all have any places that you want people in the listening audience to follow you and your work personally? Yes. No, it's okay. Um, yeah, I guess. <laughs> or not. It's um, a- yeah, I'm at the grace beyond on uh, TikTok. I, I, um, I try to post videos where I keep up with, you know, some of the things that are happening locally, politically. Um, and sometimes we'll do updates about stuff like this as well. Thank you both very much for taking the time to have this conversation for the work that you're doing. I'm glad to be in community with you. Yeah, you too, buddy. Thanks. We appreciate you. Thanks. And now some words from anarchist prisoner Sean Swain. What you say, what you say, what you say, what? We're caught like a boss! This is the list compiled by the Mapping Police Violence Project of those who were killed by police. September 2022, Peter J. Jager, Jaden Malik Carter, Jonathan May, Brian Fisher, Joshua Butler, Ernest Terrell Blackney, Corey David Garriott, Joshua A. Michael, Harrison Brown, Justin Livesay, Jimmy Janeway, Rusty Anderson, Tommy Gilmore, Nicholas McFader, Bernard Plasai, name withheld, September 4th, Federal Way, Washington, Robert Bradley, Daryl Ray Charles Lopez, Malik Amir Rockamore, Brian Childers, Linda Childs, Body Ali Jabir, Reginald Grant, Donald Wayne Henry, Tyler Woodburn, Tyler Michael Gardner, Benison Tran, Maria Tran, Name Withheld, September 8th, Middle Smithfield Township, Pennsylvania. George W. Franklin. John Stutz. Edwin Medina Barris. Daniel K. McAlpin. 
James Preston Trexler Jr. Joshua Higgins. Gabrielle Herrera Charles. Aaron Bauman. Derek Amir Ellis Cook. Carol Ross. James Edward Bought. Giovanni Luna. Igor Lannis. David Litz. Dennis McCullers. Robert Harris. Anthony Maurice Tollison. Cody Kiley. Tyshawn Malik Benjamin. Sherman Solomon. Timothy Michael Randall. Michael John Diubel. Joe Pickett. Emmanuel Padilla Torado. Anton Washington. Weston Cassidy. Marcus Adam Fuentes. Alexis Polito. Colby Archer. Rito Paul Morales. Luis Herrera. Matthew Lopez. Anthony Hopkins Sr. Name withheld September 17th. Tapanish, Washington. Name withheld September 17th. Auburn, California. Alejandro Vitela. Jeremiah James Johnson. Brian Copel. Mark Barrett Caldwell. Martin Camacho. Arlo Campbell. Rock Jordan. Colby Atkins. Berlin Gonzalez. Doris Jean Taylor. Name withheld September 22nd, Houston, Texas. Amado Aramos. Terrace Vincent Hetland. Henry Wilson Mercer. Timothy Colin Connor. Antonio Gonzalez. Darian Patrick Fisher. Ali Osman. Timothy Schaefer. Donna M. Bailey. Marlon Bonds. Leroy Quick Jr. Jalen Lewis. Jose Villanueva. Jason Charles Dunkel. Raymond Berry Twork II. Jeb Mir. Leroy Villarreal. Anthony John Graziano. Savannah Graziano. Jesus Ivan Sepulveda. Jaime Naranjo Batista. Daryl Hibbert. Daniel Joseph Sangre. Terrence Marie Sly. Everett M. Martin. Anthony Giovanni Lainez. David Gerard Jones. Jason Kildoff. Roderick Dunn. A Marion Clotter. This is Anarchist Prisoner Sean Swain from the Super Duper Uber Mega Ultra Hyper Turbo Multi Maxi Max in Youngstown, Ohio. If you're listening, you are the resistance. You can still write Sean at his new old new again address at Sean Swain number A243205 OSP Youngstown 878 Coitsville Hubbard Road, Youngstown, Ohio 44505. You can find his past writings, updates on his case, hear his past audio, find out how to get his books, plus ways to contribute to his legal defense fund at seanswain.org. For the first time in history, Asheville, North Carolina had a curfew because left-wing anarchists tried to destroy our beautiful city. This is The Final Straw Radio. The show will later be archived at thefinalstrawradio.noblogs.org, and you can email us with questions and suggestions at thefinalstrawradio at riseup.net or thefinalstrawradio at protonmail.com. This show is brought to you by Firestorm Books. 
Located at 610 Haywood Road in West Asheville, Firestorm Books is a worker-owned cooperative in Asheville specializing in offbeat, underground, and independent literature. You can find a catalog of Firestorm's books and zines, plus a full calendar of events at their website, firestorm.coop. If you would like to support The Final Straw, you can subscribe to our podcast via various platforms, follow and share our materials online, as well as give us feedback via the links at tohsr.wtf slash tree, as in link tree. To support our transcription work and wider project, you can subscribe to us via patreon.com slash tfsr. You can also buy some merch or find donation methods at tfsr.wtf slash support. The picked up the barricades and placed them two feet from the exit doors, causing an extreme fire hazard. members will tell you that there is no Antifa, that it's just a movement, but that's simply not true. There are several chapters of Antifa throughout the United States, and where's the one run for North Carolina? It's right here in Asheville.